Well, hello everyone. I'm very pleased to have with us today Jessica Madison, uh, who's currently a PhD candidate in cultural anthropology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She holds an MFA in poetry from the New School in New York City. She's currently based in Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, where she will be conducting f dissertation fieldwork until the fall of 2018. She's been working in Mongolia since 2011, when she served as a member of the United States Peace Corps working in Sukhbatar province. Her research interests include the intersection of aesthetics and critical ecology in the context of global climate change, particularly in the way local theories of landscape can broaden our understanding of the multiplicity inherent in human, non-human relations, particularly in the way they trouble the divide between natural and supernatural, living and non-living, material and immaterial. Her paper today draws from data she's collected during the first five months of her dissertation research. Please welcome Jessica. Hello everybody, thank you so much for having me. Uh -oh. Okay, so I'm actually going to begin uh, this presentation with a poem. The people of the stars shone brightly upon the canopy of heaven. Mounted on pyramids amid the total nothingness, they descended to the unknown mountains. At that time, our world was pitch black. Light radiated from the pyramids and lit up the darkness. They searched for assistance from the canopy of heaven and winged horses came flying down. The horses were how the gods appeared. Riding upon the winged horses, the shining people made a journey. For the first time, when they landed, the mountain was visible. It had absorbed the light of the people and the light of the pyramids and was itself illuminated. And so the shining mountain towered alone over the dark world. From the rock there radiated colored lights and from the soil there grew grass. Finally, there was glistening dew. Clouds of dew rose up and from them fell rain. Springs flowed from the rain and formed a lake. At the center of the shining world, covered over by the greenness of grass, there towered the golden mountain, alone and without end. The passage I just read is from famous Deragang poet Mindoyo's poem entitled Nomadic Verses. I read this section in particular to set the stage for this discussion of my dissertation project, for which I've been conducting research in Mongolia for the past five months. I'm interested in the cultural weight poetry carries in Eastern Mongolia, not only as an object of aesthetic production, but as a cultural marker that can tell us something about the way humans read and relate to the landscape they occupy, and what poetic texts can tell us about the epistemic truths that may be more difficult to access via other methods. More broadly, my research asks, in the context of a landscape that fosters such a closely interconnected re relationship between nature, culture, religion, and poetic production, what happens when that landscape is disrupted? My research looks at the Eastern Mongolian landscape through the focal points of mountains and mines. By looking at sites where industrial mines and sacred mountains exist in close proximity, I hope to broadly uncover the complexities of how religious life intersects with industrial modernity. More specifically, however, I hope to bring a challenge to the somewhat secularist and natural science-dominated cast of recent scholarship on the global Anthropocene, both by focusing on the religious and supernatural aspects of mining and by attempting to bring questions of poetics, aesthetics, and the humanities into play. I engage with a set of questions that seeks to challenge the project of enlightenment modernity that has separated the world into the discrete realms of nature, religion, politics, and so on. While the intention of much Anthropocene scholarship is to destabilize the division between nature and politics by focusing on the political ecology of accelerated human influence on environmental change, and work on the environmental humanities has sought to bring interdisciplinarity into that discourse. These discussions have often neglected the realms of what used to be called religion, the supernatural, or magic. What place do gods, spirits, blessings, and ghosts occupy in the Anthropocene? What magical ecologies make up the nature cultures of anthropogenic environmental crisis in the context of capitalist expansion? Of course, anthropological work on non-humans has always included the spiritual, religious, and supernatural aspects of animals, plants, fungi, landscapes, and so on. 
I draw on this tradition in order to explore the bio-geotechno-magical entanglement that is mineral extraction in eastern Mongolia, while also exploring the possibilities of taking an eco-theological approach to human-non-human relations that also includes a discussion of non-living and geological materials. Through my work in eastern Mongolia, I hope to unsettle the hidden theologies within the supposed secularism of the dominant Anthropocene narratives, and also look into the way the Mongolian context, particularly in the realm of industrial mining, can trouble the divide between the religious and the scientific, the natural and the supernatural, and the material and the immaterial. The anthropology of mining has been mostly concerned, and rightly so, with critiques of development, resource curses, the inner workings of mining corporations, and extraction as an agent of environmental degradation and exploitation worldwide. However, it is also vital that as anthropologists, we do not willfully allow our political beliefs to lead us to misunderstand the situation on the ground. Instead, we must recall the discipline's commitment to critical ethnography and remember that the primary contribution of anthropology to understanding environmental change is to also understand the concerns and practices of local people in managing their lives and land. In Mongolia, the doomsday clock of Anthropocene narratives doesn't explain why so many people still hold up mining as a source of hope. But neither do the eco-modernist platitudes that insist that the free market will somehow allow us, allow us to engineer our way to survival. Rural Mongolians are well aware whose interests the mining corporation serves. This is not to say that the residents of mining communities are unconcerned with the potentially deleterious effects of mining on the environment, nor that they are entirely immune to the seductive rhetorics of development and upward mobility. This ambivalence and multiplicity has of course been explored in a good deal of other recent work on mining in Mongolia, and I too follow this apparent ambivalence asking, how can a tradition that sacralizes the unbroken earth also name mines after holy mountains? So far, I have pursued two main avenues of inquiry from two different research sites. My primary research site is in Sukhbada province, where I focus on the Alftanovo pilgrimage site and the Tomurtinovo zinc mine. In Sukhbada, where poetics and landscape are closely entangled, my focus is on poetry and narrative as a potential way of understanding the multiplicity, irony, and ambivalence that has emerged around the mining boom. One of my secondary sites, which I will also discuss today, is the mountains and spoil heaps surrounding the city of Erdenet. I draw supporting data from Erdenet in order to shed light on the question of if and how a human-created landscape is understood as different from one which has not been extensively built or interfered with. My dissertation project's main intervention is problematizing the mine-mountain binary via the conce concepts of Owo and Ereden, while drawing into question attached epistemic and ethical binaries from which it arises. Currently, I am about halfway through my dissertation fieldwork research, and I also plan on pursuing further avenues of inquiry going forward, which I, if there's time, will discuss briefly at the end of the talk. So here are just some translations of terms that I'm going to use. Um, there's the word Owo, which refers to a hill, a cairn, or a heap, usually um, to the sort of piles of rocks that you'll see on the Mongolian landscape that, are, that serve sort of sacred and ritual significance. There's also the verb ovothlach, which means to heap or pile. Um, Erden, which has a complicated definition, but more or less it means treasure or fortune. Um, also discussed Tore Band, who's a sort of legendary bandit in Sukhbatar, um, known as the Mongolian Robin Hood. Um, there's also the word Ols, which means mountain, and Himel's Ols, which is like a made, man-made or artificial mountain, and Himel's Nur, which is a made or artificial lake. So in eastern Mongolia, just north of the seam that splits the grassland step from the Gobi Desert, the tiny town of Deragang sits at the foot of the holy mountain, Alstanovo. This mountain, which Mendoyo called a microcosm of the world in miniature, anchors the center of the Deregang Notak, a region known across Mongolia for its holy mountains, migrating swans, ice caves, extinct volcanoes, fast horses, healing springs, and famous poets. Alftanovo is also part of a large volcanic field that stretches across the region and over the Chinese border, border which also includes the holy mountain Shisinbokt, which is well known in poetry and songs, um, such as Naran Mandak Notak, which is the place where the rising sun first touches the nation of Mongolia. So the poet I cited to start this talk, 
uh, which is Mendoyo, was part of a group that Urjingin Horobatar termed the Deregang Three, along with uh, Dashbalbara and Yamsuran. So these three writers and their contemporaries still exert an enormous amount of influence on Mongolian literature, and according to Horobatar, the golden thread that held them together was that they were all sons of Deregang. Horobatar says, quote, the special link they shared was that they all breathed the air of Sukhbar Raimek. And in the breathing of this air was a wellspring, a creative flow which brought forth the life of Deregang's poetic triad. Not only we, but Mongolian literature also, know better than even they, the sandy hills of the standing springs in Ongon, the sun spring in Naran Bofluk, Deri Hill, which is another name for Alstanovo, and Gangan Lake, Ganganor, and this special place of genius has been described as the nation, cre nation's creative storehouse. We had grown up with them. From a very young age, we had played around them, and it is most definitely the homeland, or the law of attraction, in which is found the similarity between area's shamanic nature and the intellectual artistic nature of these three poets." End quote. Hurobatar argues that it is something about both the physical and supernatural essence of Sukhbar province, and the Deregang area in particular, that not only spurred these young men to join together to create one of the most fertile poetic movements of the 1980s in Mongolia, but that the seen and unseen contours of this landscape came to influence the course of Mongolian poetry and literature into the 20th century. So travels, travelers approaching Deregang from the north, and Deregang is sort of about here. Well, no. Travelers approaching Deregang from the north will often stop at a small crest in the road, from which one can glimp, catch a first glimpse of the Golden Mountain's distinguished, distinctive volcanic curve silhouetted above the horizon. However, if someone were to turn around and drive the 120 kilometers back to Badenert, just about here, one would see another mountain emerge into view. Tumarkinovo, a zinc mine operated by the Chinese-Mongolian joint-owned Tsert LLC. The spoil heaps of the mine cut a figure typical of the extraction projects that have increasingly come to characterize the landscape since the start of Mongolia's mineral extraction boom. Why are Alstanovo and Tumarkinovo both deemed ovo? Is this a coincidence of naming, or is there something about what an ovo is that ties the two together? And where do Obo lie on the continuum between the sacred and the profane? Alstenovo is one of the most iconic features in the idealized geography of the Deregang Notak. Like other holy mountains in the region, it is both a representation of a perfected microcosm of the world and the dwelling place of the gods. In Buddhist doctrine, the Tantra of Altanovo fused together concepts of both the sacred mountain and the mandala as a diagram of a perfect universe. However, sacred mountains predate Buddhism in Mongolia, and their veneration is rooted in shamanic traditions, in which they act as reference to the world tree, the vertical axis of a shaman's ascent and descent into other worlds. The axis of this universe points out in the four cardinal directions, and these ancient pre-Buddhist forms include stone obo, constructed around the perimeter of the holy mountain axis standing in the middle. For centuries, the magical ecology of the Deregang Notik has spun around this axis, with all of its related network of humans, non-humans, spirits, and objects, material and immaterial, held together by a poetic discourse that materializes the landscape through particular performance genres. In the context of the mining boom, performance is being marshaled to hold these landscapes together. Mining operations have been said to hire poets trained in singing long song as a safety precaution, quieting the spectral entities that have been disturbed during excavation by invoking the vast flatness of the eastern steppe. While mines also sometimes employ shamans and slams, poets are considered to be especially effective at taking care of orang, a disruptive energy contained in certain minerals and landscape forms, a ghostly influence contained within these minerals that is simultaneously material, spectral, and poetic by definition. In an earlier version of this talk, I inter repeatedly and interchangeably referred to Altanovo as Golden Mountain. Primarily, I was just following my own impulse to try to be poetic in English. I liked the sound of Golden Mountain, and I liked the ironic tension it created with Iron Heap in the title, uh, which isn't immediately obvious in Mongolian, or at least it has to be explained. But however, after seeing that earlier version, one of my friends advised me against this. So for him, there was a con concern that translating Mongolian alst into the English gold might create the idea of gold and riches in the listener. Uh -huh. 
Perhaps they might think there was actual material gold there to be mined or exploited. The post-enlightenment West often takes for granted the separation between the word and the world, that words and their configurations have effect on the material world only insofar as they spur human bodies into action. However, in Mongolia, the understanding of language and its power is much different. In this context, words have power, not only to spur ideas, but to have an actual effect on the materiality of the world. The Mongolian idiom, words can kill, thus extends also to landscape forms, and the invocation of gold in English has that potential to incite human greed and destruction. Thus, for the rest of this talk, I will refer to Altenovo only as Altenovo. So as earlier stated, Mindoyo speaks of Altenovo not only as a holy mountain, but as a microcosm of the world. So the following is a quote from his prose poem named for the mountain it speaks of. A stone from Altenovo stood in the place of honor at the rear of the Ger. My ancestors had in fact been worshiping it for five generations. This stone from Alstanovo came to life amid the mighty flames, which promised eternal peace. The light of the world had dominion over the interplay of shadows, called upon a moment of time from a thousand years ago. As my family wove their gilded stories about how Alstanovo had at that particular moment come into being, my ancestors were happily looking down upon us. In the entire world, Although regular and insignificant things are not given so much attention, it seems to be the custom to make a big deal of unusual size. We could say that the body of Alfanova was the broad expanse where the hill meets the plain, the high mountainous peaks, the fertile southern slopes, but all in miniature. Alfanova is the world on a reduced scale. Central to Mindoyo's depiction of Alfanova is the image of the stone from the mountain placed on the altar in his father's gear. Altanovo is not just a microcosm of the world, he explains, but also of the home and hearth, and those who walk on and around it, likewise, are to follow these familial roles. Stories about and involving Altanovo echo this sentiment, showing the mountain to be both a stage and a microcosm from which to observe the ideal manner in which humans should interact with and relate to the landscapes, non-human animals, spirits, and one another. Are these stories as these stories are passed on, they not only incite human imagination and shape future behavior, but also literally create contours on the landscape itself as men climb and women circumnambulate the mountain, wearing grooves in the earth that guide the paths of future worshipers and visitors. So the genre of the Altanova story is thus echoed in genres of movement, particularly as it involves gender performance. Altanova is what some call a men-only obo, the women still actively participate in its worship, just from a different vantage point. The circumnambulation of groups of women around the mountain that takes place while male counterparts are at its peak is a place for women to bond and reflect together, often walking arm in arm, discussing the intricacies of life, intricacies of life with occasional pauses to pray, give offerings, or place calls to mothers and sisters, holding their phones up to the mountain so faraway loved ones can whisper prayers, wishes, and messages to the listening, sl listening slopes. When discussing this gendered separation of worship space, possibly in anticipation of voice concerns from tourists and visitors, my friends and interlocutors are quick to point out that this gender separation does not necessarily indicate subjugation. Of course, this is an issue with the diversity of views, but by and large, the act of avoiding the peak for women is not seen as an imposition. At most, it is seen as a small sac act of sacrifice and support akin to serving men first during meals. To circumnambulate is a queenly action, to ascend is kingly, and comparisons are often drawn to the clever and wise queens of history, or to the wife of Tarebant, secretly supporting her husband, using only her wits, and hidden in the cover of darkness, breaking him from prison with a lockpick hidden in a block of cheese. There is also an element of risk contained in stories of women at Altanovo. Most stories about curses leveled on wrongdoers do involve the behavior of women, such as one who urinated on top of the mountain and cursed her family for three generations, or the one who stole a piece of gold from the top and was likewise unlucky until she managed to return it. Men are, of course, also subject to such rules. But the stakes of bad behavior do seem to be higher for women, perhaps a truth that is echoed in both the home hearth and in the broader social world. So many stories about Stanovo also involve the illustrious Shing era horse thief Toreband, a hero son of Sukhbatar, who is often referred to as Mongolian Robin Hood. Many of Deragong's landmarks, and Altanovo in particular, appear in Toreband stories as both setting and character, 
from the ice caves where he hid to avoid det detection to the very slopes of Altanovo. So one of the most beloved stories involving Torreband and Altanovo was told to me recently by a friend of mine. So Torreband, as he often is, was being chased uh, on horseback by Shing officials, and they finally had him trapped on top of the sacred mountain. So if you look at Altanovo from the side, there's one side that's kind of more of a gentle slope on which you can, most people will climb up, and then there's another side that's very steep. Um, his pursuers knew they had him cornered since he, there was, as they thought, no way his horse would be able to run down the steep, nearly vertical northern slope on the other side. However, the horse devoted to entrusting of Torabant ran down the slope with hooves bleeding, allowing him to just barely escape his pursuers. This is indicative of a unique understanding of the relation between humans and non-humans. In this tale, mountain and horse together take on the role of protecting and transforming their human counterpart through mutual trust, devotion, and in the case of Torreban's horse, sacrifice. So though it is a subject for another talk, the animals that appear on or near Altanovo also act as emissaries and representatives of the mountain and fulfillers of the wishes and desires of the people who visited. So, for example, this um, snake that a friend of mine saw on top of the Ovo is um, the Edzen, or master of Altanovo, and seeing it you know, bestows you with a lot of fortune and good luck. Um, it's very rare to see a snake on top. Um, also, there is a Hosan, or a wild donkey, that lives sort of in the boundary of Altanovo, who has a little horse companion, um, and is sort of seen as an ideal of quickness. Um, so that's why they sort of happen with the horses. About 15 kilometers northeast of the Sukhbada province, capital of Baranart, sits Timurtinovo, an open pit zinc mine and the largest mining operation in the region. From the road, one can easily catch a glimpse of the spoil banks of the mine, and from a distance, their gentle flat top curve appears eerily similar to the curves of Altanovo. Like many zinc deposits, and somewhat ironically like Altanovo itself, Timurtinovo is volcanic. In addition to zinc, there are a number of minerals either being extracted or explored for in the area. So this list includes semi-precious stones such as beryl and fluorite, iron, manganese, tungsten, and molybdenum. The extraction site broke ground in 2005 and is run by Tsert LLC, a joint Mongolian-Chinese cooperation, cooperation venture. The mine itself is the primary employer in the region. providing nearly 500 jobs and contributing to public welfare projects such as scholarships for university students, infrastructure development, and so on. According to Tsert Minerals literature, this project has been praised by both the Mongolian and Chinese central governments as being a model project of Sino-Mongolian cooperation. Though there are local concerns about the mine, revolving in particular around the economic strain caused by boom economies, the possibility of lead contamination in the city's water, uh, which is not uncommon for zinc mines, which have a high instance of lead byproduct, and concerns about most of the zinc resources going to China, the instability of the underground ecosystem, and a general aesthetic distaste for extraction projects. Most residents of Sukhbadar feel generally positive about the mine's presence in the region. While most local residents acknowledge that having such a project nearby is a sacrifice, the wealth and fortune that has ge it generated by it over the past six years, though it has slowed considerably since its height in 2013, is seen by many as, quote, worth it. It is in this cycle of fortune and sacrifice that we can see how a mine might be somewhat like an oval, though perhaps of a different sort. Though the term obo can mean either mountain, heap, or cairn, its most common usage refers to a constructed physical structure with ritual significance, from a pile of rocks to an elaborate stupa. From Christopher Atwood's definition, the obo is multifunctional. It can act as a site of sacrifices to local deities and spirits, as a border marker, and as a physical manifestation of the link between humans and land. And this can be a property link or a symbolic link. The Obo situated atop a mountain hilltop, or in the case of the steppe, a rise of an auspicious configuration, is a ubiquitous site across the Mongolian landscape. 
and Obo and Buddhist areas are usually built with three levels and 12 small heaps in the cardinal directions, imitating the continents around Sumbur, the world mountain in Buddhist cosmology. During sacrifices, pr practitioners tie ropes from the ground to the Obo's peak. Regardless of the religious context, Obo rituals are quite similar everywhere. The pre-Buddhist deities worshipped their various Tingr, Gatrinitid, shamanic ancestor spirits, and so on. Obo accumulate materials to the offering of those who pass by, who should contribute something to the pile to gain energy and avoid misfortune. Offerings can simply be more stones, or something more specific like horse skulls, car parts, candy tea or rice, sometimes even children's toys like Barbie dolls. In Dedagong and elsewhere, Obo offerings and sacrifices are a type of what Rebecca Emson calls harnessing, a practice of obtaining and accumulating shares of fortune in order to generate luck, wealth, and prosperity. There are various ways to gather fortune from outside the family home to ensure increases in family members, livestock, and material goods, or erden, so working would be an example of this. And important to this notion is an idea of inside-outside relations, their separations and their movements. Fortune is a force that can be gained at particular moments, most significantly for us, moments of extraction. Thus we see how just as practices like Obo worship generate fortune through sacrifices and flirting with violation by outsiders, so might mining. It goes without saying that the mining boom has generated a great deal of fortune for many Mongolians and that much of this wealth is created through relations with foreign mining companies, mostly from Russia and China, but also Australia and Canada, as is the case with the largest mining projects in the country, Rio Tinto's Oyo Tolgoi and Taban Tolgoi. However, Mining also demands a sacrifice. Material extraction transforms the empty flatness of the Deragong Notic by poking holes in it. Through desertification, extinction, toxic runoff, angry spirits, and so on. However, this tension also precedes mining. Even as poets attempt to sing the step into flatness, its verticality persists in the form of layered histories, buried treasure, human constructions, and haunted topologies. Ancestral spirits and masters of the land accrete around ovals and the ruins of monasteries burned down in the socialist era. History is born by the oral literature necessitated by centuries of mobility, both forced and unforced, that crisscrossed the landscape. In search of value, sacrifices are made both small and large. The gentle sacrifice of an offering will leave the material earth intact and, with the, and will yield immaterial fortune. The accelerated Anthropocene sacrifice of mining, in which the earth is broken and treasure erupts, reveals the uncanny desires hidden within the peaceful steppe. Because even an undisturbed steppe is disturbed, the grassland that seems vast and empty is in fact overcrowded with people, grazing animals, and spirits. Poetry, and Long Song in particular, attempts to smooth these disturbances by invoking this flatness through both mimicking the shape of the land and inspiring romantic fantasies in the listener, but it is somehow always already failing. The mining boom is no different, except that it has sharply highlighted these failures by producing a set of dilemmas for both rural and urban Mongolians as they attempt to reconcile an idea of homeland that is produced both by ecological wholeness and the production of treasure and fortune through outside, often destructive relations. These tensions and rewards created by proper relations with outsiders is detailed by Marissa Smith, who argues that Erdogan itself is generated not only via risky, but prescribed social interaction with foreigners and outsiders, such as drinking or mining, but that these rewards for the behavior also extend to the landscapes. She compares the off-sided difference between Russian and Chinese mining practices in which Abandoned Russian mines are still able to generate Erdin for the Mongolian nation, whereas some Chinese projects with equipment left behind maintain no such value. And one wonders how the rewilding strategies planned for the future by certain Anglo-European mining ventures will fare under this criteria. Thus, the ambivalence of mining in Mongolia is simultaneously ethical, political, econ economic, sacred, and cultural, full of both promise and danger. This ambivalence is visible through language, poetry, ritual, myths, and other traditional cultural fo forms that nevertheless are adaptable enough to incorporate the mine, a paragon of industrial modernity, into the very sacred landscape that produced them, which they produced in the first place. 
Psalms and blessing singers are on the payroll at the mine to mitigate the spiritual upheaval of removing things from the ground. This upheaval creates a site of sacrifice that is like the sacrifices described above, but defined by danger and disruption, as opposed to the certain ideal of microcosmic completeness um, symbolized by Alstonobel. Alstonobel's character is defined by its wholeness, and its rituals are intended to appeal and maintain that wholeness, producing what my friends call a sort of spiritual editin, while the character of Tumbrushinobo is defined by its physical rupture. Rituals for that oboe are mobilized to dissuade this inherent disruptive nature, which is both destructive and productive of the landscape, a landscape upon which Alstonobo also depends. So now we'll move on to the site of Ertenet. So what is the difference then between an os and a himmel's os? between obo and obosoch, between sacred and profane forms of fortune. How does the concept of eridin intersect with material substance? Though my project mostly focuses on the Eastern Steppe, I felt it was valuable to also collect ethnographic data in Eridinet, the site of some of Mongolia's earlier industrial extraction projects, and a vital entry point for understanding the confluence of extraction with historical change, particularly that which is more or less aligned with so-called Anthropocene rupture points, in this case, the great acceleration of the Cold War. As a friend of mine recently said, Eridinet is like a cow. You keep it you care for it, and it keeps giving you milk. Erdenet has been feeding the Mongolian nation for a long time, and thus we can take from Erdenet freely. So this past summer, I had a chance to visit Erdenet Copper Mine in the company of a local English professor, who I'll call Erden Solved. Driving past the enormous spoil banks of the mine, I remarked how much they themselves look like a mountain. Erdin Solved agreed and made a point of mentioning that though the banks did very much resemble an Oth mountain, in truth they were only a Himmel's Oth, a made mountain. A similar sentiment was put forward by the mine's safety engineer as we stood at the mouth of the gaping pit that was once a mountain. Behind us, contained behind more massive dirt piles and spoil banks, was a Himmel Nor, a man-made lake responsible for cleaning and cooling the runoff from the mine. The safety engineer described it as one of two filtration systems responsible for cleaning and renewing the mining site's water. In Mongolia and elsewhere, the mine exists as something formed, an opening made in the earth with the purpose and intention of extracting something from it. It generates wealth and fortune, demands sacrifice, and in a strange way, strengthens a particular relationship between human beings and landscape based on the accumulation of fortune. The Himethul speaks to a relationship between humans and landscape that is very much intertwined, perhaps an intensification of the fortune and sacrifice exchanges that occur around Obo. An Obo, after all, is something that has been Obo-son, heaped, piled, constructed from other things. Though a mine spoil heap might not exactly be like a mountain or religious Obo, it has been constructed in the same way, an uncanny similarity that remains apparent in the formal echoes of its shape against the horizon and in its function for generating wealth and fortune. The affective character of industrial modernity is transformation, in which extraction creates the uncanny mountain in the form of the Himmel's Oath. Central to the idea of the uncanny is that something has always been present, but that should have remained hidden is brought to light. Like a deeply buried family secret suddenly brought to the surface, the unveiling of this sinister something dramatically unsettles our basic ideas of how the world works, or what the world even is. The mind landscape is haunted, both materially and affectively, not only by the spirits unearthed by extraction activity, but also by the memory of the old that is contained within both the pit and the himmel old, the negative space and the man-made pile consisting of what the mountain once was. Later on, as we gazed upon the mine from atop the hill that hosts the newly built Golden Buddha statue, Edward and Solved remarked upon the himmel old once again. Every year, it gets closer and closer to town. I asked if she found such a sight disturbing. Yes, it's a little worrying, she replied. Worse, however, she said, was the large cloud of white dust that surrounded the city, a hazy aura that can be seen from afar. Lots of people say it's smoke from the Dench, Gare District, she told me, as we walked back towards the car. But I think it's also toxic dust from the edge of the Himmel's Nor, the lake. This dust is what is left behind after all of the fortune has been extracted, a ghostly echo from the mine itself. The mine is not the opposite of a mountain here, 
but it's shadow and it's uncanny double. This uncanny affect also echoes the central conceit of Anthropocene scholarship that posits that human beings now have the agency of gods, with the godlike power to suddenly be able to wield the measurable ability to act on the material world, to move mountains, to turn them into pits. Modern secularist rationality, which balances on the Enlightenment era assurance of human mortality and the knowledge that human beings are not gods and that gods do not act on the world, is thrown into question, not dismantled entirely, but at least unsettled. Agentive human beings with godlike powers create this uncanny affect, which Freud defines as easily produced by facing the distinction between imagination and reality, such as when something that we have hitherto regarded as imaginary appears before us in reality. The world as it exists in tandem with a world made by humankind, which also suggests the threat of its own potential annihilation. Ereden are treasure or valuables that, as I cited before, Marissa Smith says can be contained through interactions with different sets of relations that are at once inside and outside. These can be among and between living humans, the deceased, the unborn, and non-human entities. These immaterial entities are spirits, ancestors, deities, and can also include an array of energies belonging to wild animals, mountains, healing springs, the very forces that shape the landscape itself. The editing produced by these relations is multiform and eternally reproducible, and it can also refer to herd animals, precious gemstones and metals, knowledge, and human persons, like children. Likewise, the iconic religious elements of the Chandvan Erden and the material Erden of copper, molybdenum, and malachite are both derived from the interior of the sacred mountain oval and from the mine, with both forms generating thus kinds of fortune. The murals from Gok and Erdenet depict both as coming from the site that was once a mountain and now a mine. In the Erdenet City Museum, there are paintings of an intact mountain with glowing Erden at its core, juxtaposed with paintings of a mined mountain with glowing Erden being carted away in trucks. And unfortunately, they, we weren't allowed to take my, uh, pictures inside that museum, so I don't have them for you. You just have to imagine. I know the curator. Oh, really? I'll talk to you Excellent. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to sneak, but the, yeah. the guard was right there. Um, the difference between the mine and the sacred mountain is not necessarily in the kind of fortune or energy they generate, whether spiritual or material, but in the form the heap and extraction itself takes. There is then the question of how poetry is involved in shaping the figure of Erdonet, which is something I will probably get into as I continue my research. So, narratives of secular modernity and Western environmentalism tell us that mountains and mines are placed in a direct binary opposition between secular and non-secular, modern and traditional, industrial and emotional, and so on. However, here we see that they exist as interdependent nodes in a complex interrelationship of various human and non-human worlds, and within multiple cosmologies, and perhaps multiple secularities as well. The mine has just as much a place in the cosmological world as the mountain has in the secular one, which suggests that perhaps the divisions between nature and culture, natural and supernatural, that we often take for granted may be more troubled than we suspect. The difference between the industrial mining site and the sacred mountain in both of these examples is not the expected distinction between sacred and profane, with the mine standing in secular opposition to the holy mountain. Rather, Poetic engagements and sacrifices, both ritual and affective, reveal the mind as uncanny human-made double of the mountain, haunted by its own spirits, emerging from its own eruption. Um, so that's the end of my talk. I have a few questions going forward, but we don't have to necessarily get into those now. Um, and here are my citations. Um, while you were talking at the beginning um, about Dargang and Mindoyo and all mm -hmm. the sort of creative poets, mm -hmm. I was remind, reminded that um, I think Dargang is supposed to also be kind of like a silversmithing mm -hmm. center. Yes. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, about Smiths. Um, Not to be uh, self-centered as a person named Smith, but... <laughs> anyway. um, I don't. I haven't really gone much into the study of Smiths, but yeah, blacksmithing is a is a big thing in Deragong, um, as is jewelry making, particularly with uh, turquoise and coral. 
Um, so that is something that, that is not a connection that I made before, but that is something that I will definitely have to, to look into. Uh, thanks for the talk. I think it was a nice kind of introduction <laughs> to um, the, the discourse that's currently holding you on mining. I, I'm curious if you talk to miners themselves and how they talk about um, their mining prospects, you know, whether they use uh, this kind of traditional or poetic vocabulary, if they're aware of it, um, and you know, and, uh, if you feel that like you have the need to expose them to maybe poetry or other uh, like, traditional thinking about um, mm -hmm. Um, in Sukhbader, uh poetry education is pretty central to the curriculum. Um, so these are pretty famous, famous poets in the region, and everyone kind of knows each other a little bit. So I mean, it depends on who you ask. Obviously, some people are more poetically inclined than others. Um, but from what I found, um, most people that work in the mine are very much kind of aware of these tensions and have to kind of grapple with it on a day-to-day -day basis because, I mean, like I said, it's a huge employer. Um, there's been a lot of development in the region. They also, the mine puts a lot of money forward to like cultural, cultural projects. So there's a theater that's been built um, with sort of back taxes from the mine. So it's, I mean, again, it depends on, a, on the person, but there is sort of, each person kind of holds this tension when they, when they talk about it. Yeah. 